Today we're going to talk about four different ideas. Your uniform slope, limits of work, and in the second lecture we're going to talk about the process you're going to use and your assignment. To start with, we want to talk about why you want to have uniform slopes. Now, frankly, there are three really simple answers here. Number one, they're easy to build, they're less finicky. You want to keep it as simple as you can. Uh, second one, a consistent slope is safer for the user, and we're going to talk about that both in terms of pedestrians and in vehicles. And last, of course, it's helpful in the design process. It's actually easier, it creates a straight contour pattern with exact spacing that repeats. We use uniform slopes most often as an issue of convenience and safety. That is, if you're on a bicycle or if you're walking or even driving a vehicle, a uniform slope is a much more convenient and safe design. And for these designs, we have standards that we have to follow as professionals. So for example, if you're doing an entrance walk or a pedestrian way, you can see here we have extreme ranges and desirable ranges. The desirable ranges are almost always a lower slope. So for example, for an entrance way, we want to have a slope between one and 4%. I tend to use two and so will you. And for pedestrian ramps, you can go up to an 8% slope for a limited distance. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about ADA issues. So the reason we use uniform slopes for pedestrians is simply to keep people from slipping, falling, or tripping. By having a consistent slope, people don't tend to stumble as much. And by making that slope fairly gentle, as in you know, between one and 4%, they don't tend to slip as much during the ice or if they're using canes or wheelchairs, et cetera. We also like to use these sort of standards for circulation systems like bikeways or public areas where folks are gonna be using um, wheelchairs or carriages or even just moving things along in a dolly. We want to try to keep the slopes as simple and uniform as possible so that frankly, we don't surprise people while they're walking or biking because they're probably not gonna be paying that much attention to the surface that they're riding or walking on. For terraced or seating areas, we also use uniform slopes and these are much more gentle slopes. So desirable range, we want between one and 2%. That's just enough to get the water to drain, but so people don't really feel that they're walking on a slope. So for example, a 2% slope that you might find in a common parking lot or on a sitting plaza, you won't even notice that it's sloping as you're walking across it or sitting down, but it does allow the water to drain off very nicely. Now, of course, if you're talking about a deck, you don't necessarily need the water to drain off quite as well because the water will flow between the boards of the deck. But some decks are actually completely waterproof, and for those, you're still going to want a slope. And certainly on a terrace that's stone or concrete, you're going to want a slope of 1% to 2% so the water will drain off and will not freeze and cause people to slip on the surface. And here we have an example of an outdoor dining area. The other reason we want to slope here is we want to make sure that the water runs away from the building, not towards the building. So you should expect to see probably about a 2% slope running away from the building. So the water will actually drain into the planters in this case. And again, when you walk across this, you won't even recognize this as a slope at all. People simply don't perceive it when they're outside as a slope surface. They perceive it as a relatively level walking surface. And we have different standards for driveways and roads. So for example, in a road, you can go between one and 12%. For service drives, maybe up to 10%. A lesser amount is always preferred because again, you do have inclement weather and you have ice and snow on these surfaces. So whenever you can get them down to around a 2%, that's always preferable. But of course you can go up to greater percentages if you need to. Driveways are frankly a special sort of roadway, if you will, and keeping these as level as you can is really important. It's not just for playing basketball, but to have something around a 2% slope, especially right adjacent to the garage, makes it much easier for parking your car and for moving things around, opening and closing the doors. It's also safer for things that might be rolling out to the street because they won't roll at such a high speed. 
So again, it is a driveway. You want to keep the slopes adjacent to the garage as level as you can, around 2% or so. And then of course, further away from the garage, if you're not parking a vehicle there, you can go to a greater slope. But you can see that if it's an area that you're going to be parking a vehicle, you want to get that slope down as far as you can and still allow positive drainage away from the building. And for some types of circulation, we want to add an additional slope, that is a cross slope. So for example, a bicycle path or a long sidewalk, we really do not want the water to sheet flow along the length of the path or the bicycle trail. We want the water to sheet off to the side as quickly as possible. So in this case, you'll actually have two slopes. You might have the 4% slope, which is in the direction that people are walking or bicycling, but you'll have a 2% cross slope that gets the water off of the path as quickly as possible. Again, because in cold weather, things are going to freeze and you're going to have ice. You want to get that water off of the surface as fast as you can, preferably before it freezes. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how you create uniform slopes. And for purposes of these examples, you might just imagine that this is a parking area uh, where you'd have vehicles. It could be a storage area as well. And water is going to be running off of it in one direction. So you can do this with a simple slope that is sloped in one direction. So it's actually just one plane. To do this, you would set the spot elevations on the corner of the surface according to the slope that you're trying to get. So please note in this drawing that the spot elevations are at different elevations. The top spot elevations are at 32.5, the bottom elevations are at 30.75, and water is draining downhill off of this slope. When we do a design like this, we're going to have contours that are running parallel to one another across the slope that is perpendicular to the direction of the slope. So in this case, we've got a 37.5 spot elevation at the bottom. Moving up from that, we're going to have a 31 contour, then a 32 contour, and then eventually a 32.5 spot elevation. Now, of course, these contours are going to have to connect to the existing contours once they run off of the uniform slope. So here you can see you've got the 31 contour connecting to the 31 and the 32 contour connecting to the 32. And we can also look at this with a different surface. And in this case, we place the contours closer together because the slope that the uniform surface is sitting on top of is a steeper slope. And again, in this case, we're going to be connecting the proposed contours into the existing contours as they come off of the uniform slope. And of course, we have to include the required information, the spot elevations on the corners, the slope that's indicated across the uniform slope. And of course, that is always in the steepest direction, and that would be perpendicular to the contours going down the steepest part of the slope. We can also combine different uniform slope surfaces together. So in this case, we have two uniform slopes that are actually angled towards one another. And the water would then, of course, drain to the middle and out at the bottom. And to calculate these again, we set the spot elevations at the outside corners, you'll notice that these are the same elevation going across, and then we establish our slopes going towards the center. From that information, using the slope calculations, we can then determine what the elevations will be in the center of this folded uniform slope. That is, we have one slope on one side, one slope on the other side, and this is basically a fold line like the fold in a book or a piece of paper, and the water would drain down to the center. Now, because this represents two uniform slopes that slope towards one another, the contour lines would be parallel to each other on each of the separate slopes. And then, of course, we have to connect those proposed contours into the existing contours 
And this makes obvious that sometimes having a more complicated design where we have two slopes together will decrease how much grading we actually have to do around the corners of the surface. And that's one of the things you want to strive for in your designs is to reduce how much grading is actually done, reducing how much soil we actually disturb in the process of building our design. And of course, we have to include the slope information just like any other uniform slope. This then creates enough knowledge that a contractor can actually build these two slopes and join them together in the middle. The second concept that we need to talk about in this lecture is something called the limit of work. And this is another way that we control how much of the site we disturb. And basically, there are a couple of rules we have to follow. First off, we cannot grade across property lines. We do not own the land on the adjacent lot. We're not allowed to put our equipment over there. So we need to stay well away from the property lines. Second is that we cannot grade under existing trees in order to preserve the health of the trees. And the third one is we want to return to existing grade in a smooth line as possible. And that's an aesthetic issue. We do not want our design to look like it abruptly ends, but actually we want it to blend into the existing landforms. So here we have a site plan that is not unlike the assignment you're about to undertake. And we've highlighted the property line. This blue line around the outside is the property line. What you will want to do is you're actually going to offset in 10 feet on all of these property lines. And this is the limit of work. You do not want to grade beyond that 10 feet with the exception of the right of way. So down here at the right of way, we're allowed to grade past the property line in order to connect to the road if necessary. But for the other three sides of the lot, we absolutely want to come in 10 feet, set a line, and that's going to be our limit of work. We're not going to go past that limit of work. The second limit of work we want to be aware of is trees. The tree roots will actually extend normally beyond the canopy of the tree. But for simple design work that you're doing right now, you want to use the canopy of the tree as an assumed boundary for where the roots are. You do not want to disturb any ground within the drip line of the canopy of the tree. In fact, you actually want to move beyond that. So again, looking at a typical plan, we have some trees outlined in blue, but you'll also notice that we will offset beyond that and we will say that is also a limit of work line. That we will do no disturbance within that dashed blue line in order to protect the health of the tree. And the last portion of limit of work is the idea of these tick marks. And we want our contour lines to come back so that they are actually running in the same direction as the existing contours. So our proposed contour will come back and it will curve until it runs parallel with the existing contour. These tick marks then become a de facto limit of work. There's no reason to disturb any land beyond that. And you actually want to encourage a contractor to try not to store too much equipment out in these areas because it'll also compact the earth. So uniform slope and limit of work are the two simple concepts that we want to cover in this short lecture. The next lecture will cover the process you're going to undertake using your assignment as an example.